You're listening to The Crypt and I'm very excited about today's very special guest, Anthony Stewart Head. He played Giles and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the Prime Minister in Little Britain and Will's dad in The Inbetweeners, to name but a few. And now he's released a brand new album, Staring at the Sun. So you're very welcome to the show, Anthony. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be with you. That's great. Well, first, I want to go back to 1997 when you accepted a role on a TV show that would go on to have an insanely massive cult following. And that, of course, was Rupert Giles and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Could you talk a bit how that role came about? Um, well, it was second or third time I've been out to LA. I'd already done a, um, a season of a series called VR5. And then I'd been out for a couple of pilot seasons. And sort of, it's a, it's a very sort of... Um, suck it be when you're out there as an English actor and mm-hmm. I went up for, for this I read the script of two episodes I think and just loved it and absolutely loved it and I, I remember there's a friend of mine who, who used to live uh, in Topeka Canyon which is in between sort of Studio City and, and Hollywood and I, I popped in for a cup of tea or coffee on the way across the, the hills and uh, I said I, I really want this job and he said well you'll get it then um and I, I remember uh, I, I auditioned for Joss, um, and Marcia Shulman was the, the casting director at that point, and uh, I offered him up, I said, look, this somewhere between Alan Rickman in, uh, as the Sheriff of Nottingham mm-hmm. uh, and, um, and Prince Charles, what would you like? And he said, well, why don't you give me both? <laughs> Charles was born, um, sort of a bit plummy and a bit, bit far back in the throat. Yeah. <laughs> um, a bit, um, not really, you know, bubbly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when, he, when he's called for, when his, when his metal is called for, that's when he switches into Alan Rickman. Well, that's it, but he was such a well developed character. He was one of the most well developed in the whole Buffy verse. Because he went from being kind of really bookish to being quite the badass in the end. Which which Giles did you prefer playing? I love the fact that he was so rounded. I mean, the, the, it, it's one of the, the lovely things about working on a, a long-running series is that the, the, the writers get to know you and you get to know the writers and you get to know the character. And so everybody sort of starts, to, the character becomes more and more and more fully formed. And the yeah. thing that Joss was brilliant about, brilliant at, was... He was, you know, nothing happened without there being a repercussion, without it affecting the character. Mm-hmm. There were obviously life-changing things happening, and consequently one was able to, sort of, um, to, to, to translate it into how the character evolved. And there was, a, there was a, something that my, my partner, Sarah, gave me, which was, I think it was going from season two into season three, mm-hmm. which was after... Jenny Callender was killed by Angel. Yes. <laughs> and she basically, I said, I want something physical that that shows how much he's affected. And she said, well, why not turn it into that? Into he, he, he becomes much sharper in his look. Yeah. And I start, and I was, uh, I went into sort of these um, three three piece suits that were, that were just much sharper, um, and the glasses were more angular. And it was it was literally basically him him showing resolve against the world that basically don't mess with me i'm now you know and it and it and it's very interesting when you look at yourself in the mirror as your character and you see um you know the people always say when they put the costume on it, it it's that that final leap um and it's true when you see your characters change a different look and it and it affects the way you you feel and also you're doing it obviously doing it from the inside out hopefully <laughs> And then, how did you feel when you heard you were going to get to sing in the musical episode? Once more, a feeling. That was right, right at the beginning when we were doing. We, the, no one really believed in Buffy. None of the suits really, really got it. And it was a bit of a, oh, all right then. Well, we might as well let's let's not do a pilot. Let's just do a half-hour presentation, uh, which basically was an edited pilot script. Um, and Joss directed, and we had a crew that really didn't really, it was the first time he'd ever directed, and it was a very odd kind of filming, it was very strange, um, and we were waiting to go to the library set, and we were standing, me, him and Sarah were standing um, backstage while they were relighting, and I just got talking about, we just got talking about musicals, and I said that I'd done a few, and I love, I love doing musicals, and Joss announced that he, had, he has a huge passion for musicals, and Sarah said she liked them too, um, and 
basically we said that we must do it something let's, let's do a, a, a wouldn't it be cool if we did a, a musical buffy episode and every season i'd say what about a buffy musical and he'd go no no it feels like if, if we do it now it would just feel like we've run out of ideas yeah and then suddenly um just before season six was that summer got a cd through the post we all got a cd through the post of joss bashing out the the tunes on his piano and singing all the boys' parts and Kai, his wife, singing all the girls. And it was like, oh my God, we got a musical. Yeah, it was an amazing episode. The and songs I, were fantastic. I, every moment of the process, I just loved because it was, it, A, Joss was directing and, and, and never Joss directed. It was just, it was a really special occasion. Um, and he was just, it was just brilliant. It was fantastic. And we had, we had you know, choreography and, you know, to me, uh, it, it didn't go on long enough. <laughs> and aside from Once More with Fee, then, would you have a favourite episode outside that? Um, I think Hush was pretty cool. I mean, there were there were several standout episodes, but, and I think it is to someone's shame, whether it's the Fox, WB, or I don't know. But the fact that Buffy never won an Emmy it was never it was nominated a couple of times. The second time, I think, I think Once More with Feeling was. Was they, they forgot yeah. to nominate it. It was one of those weird things. But um, The Body is the most extraordinary episode when Buffy discovers that her mother dies. And it's, the, it's beautiful TV. It's extraordinary. I mean, Josh said that he was thinking of not using any, any uh, music, any soundtrack. And I, I said, well, that's a great idea. And I, and I referred to um, Roman Polanski's... Uh, I can't remember. It was one, one of the, a, a film of Polanski's that he, he doesn't use any gore. He just has... Mm-hmm. A band of street musicians that occasionally play, but Joss did it, and, then, and there's there's no music in it. And he just uses ambient sounds, and it's the most extraordinary moving episode. And he uses Anya, the character that oh, ends, she was fantastic in it, who speaks her mind mm-hmm. and basically just says what it's like um, when someone that you love dies, and just says I don't I don't want I don't like this. I don't understand? It's just 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 brilliant writing, brilliant brilliant writing, and there's no. No accident. I'm, I, I just went in. I'm doing a, um, a very interesting job next week. Doing one day, I'm doing a guest role on a, a, a new series called Galavant, which mm-hmm. is for ABC, with, uh, with, with, with songs. And uh, just talking to the, to the producers when we were singing, and I just happened to mention Buffy, and they both went, ah, oh. um, because so many producers and writers. Um, you know, in, in, in LA now, in Hollywood, basically, they came, they grew up with Buffy. Well, that's it. Buffy is sort of like the writer's handbook, brilliant writing. And they were saying, perfectly formed series, ended exactly at the right time, the ending was brilliant and didn't leave you wanting more. It just was, you know, it was a very, very clever series. It was. It ra- wrapped it up perfectly. I, love, I, I still love, you know, dipping in every now and again. We still watch it ourselves. <laughs> I got up this morning and my eight-year-old was downstairs at 20 past seven watching Buffet, fully dressed for school. She loves it. <laughs> there you go. First season is a little dated, but the rest of it is actually, you know, once we got into 35 mil, the show looked really cool. And the, the themes, you know, once we got out of first season, we weren't allowed to show bad. We weren't, you know, we were really restricted. Mm-hmm. Um, but they sort of let that go as time went on. So from the second season on, it's still a pretty cool current show. And I get so many young people who, who are watching it now. I think of are either Little Britain fans or Merlin fans or, you know. And then whatever happened then to the spin-off Ripper? Uh, <laughs> what happened was it got busy. Oh. Um, it was something that we discussed. He still apologises to me for it, bless his heart. It was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel really bad about that. Because um, it just, it, it so nearly got going. A couple of times I introduced him to um, people from the BBC that um, that really wanted to do it. It, it looked like um, a, friend of, a friend of mine, Judy Gardner, who was a producer on Merlin and, and on Doctor Who, who, who then set up in LA and is now part of BBC Worldwide. So I, they wanted to meet each other. They, and it that really looked for a minute like there was something going to happen. And then... Then he had dinner with Lisa, uh, um, Lisa Dishku, and they came up on the spot with the idea for Dollhouse. From that moment on, he was then three seasons into that, two or three seasons into that. Um, and it's just sort of, 
and now he's sort of not really part of the, um, the Buffy verse. I mean, he is because he's, he's still doing the comic book. But the idea, I think, of, of dipping back into a TV version of it. Who knows? I mean, you can never say never. Well, that's a it'd be fantastic. Me, I, I mean, the, I would love to do the the idea that he had for the pilot episode or the one-off that we're going to do was absolutely beautiful. It's a, a really, really haunted ghost story, and it, it it could it could stand on its own. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be attached to to Giles or Buffy or any of the rest of it. Um, so. Who knows? Maybe one day he might do it. He might do that as a comic book. I mean, he he loves that. The, the, the fact that you know, that, that, um, in comics you can go wherever you want and do whatever you want mm-hmm. not by effects or you know, um, visuals. Um, and I, you know, I don't know. I, I, all I, all I know is that at the moment uh, he's a bit busy. Well, <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. One day we get to see it. <laughs> Well, yeah. Let's. let's I, I. I. mean, if nothing else, I would just. I would love to work with Josh. Just, yeah. just, uh, and he's. A, and he's a, a really nice guy. It's been, it's, it's. Um. It's fun working with him, and he's just got such a handle on 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 people. Mm-hmm. That um. He just. He, he writes the character. It's just. It's. It's a really lovely experience. Also, then you played the prime minister in Little Britain. Now, when I sit and watch that, I always think. How in the name of God is he getting through that scene without laughing? Because David Williams is simply hilarious. Would it take like many takes to get through it? Thankfully, we rehearse. You, you kind of get the laughs out of the way when you're rehearsing. And also, when you're doing it in front of a live audience who are being recorded, you know you've only got two, three, at the most, maybe four at a push takes. Yeah. So you can't. You just can't. And I mean, that might, for some people, that might be the trigger that, you know, makes you, you can't stop laughing. It's like when you get, I mean, now, when I, if I get the giggles on set about something, I know it's short, it has to be short-lived. Mm-hmm. Because it always seems such fun at the time. But then, then you look around at the crew, who after the third or, you know, third giggle, they're not laughing anymore. It's like... Can you just get on and finish the shot? Yeah, I suppose they get to that point where we want to go home. It's getting on now. Exactly. It's terribly funny for the person involved, but actually everyone else is just suffering it. <laughs> so um, you have to suck it up and just, you know, get on with it. And I've got, you know, I've, I've been around I've been around for a while now. And I've kind of got adept at being able to shut it down if I feel that sort of that bubble of... of but it's it's quite fun to sort of let it let it bubble under because it gives you an energy that, um, that otherwise you wouldn't have. But the only time, there's one time when when David um, snogged me. Basically, when we rehearsed it, he just sort of did a little peck. And then when we went on camera in the evening, uh, he opened his mouth and covered most of my face. And uh, the first take, I laughed. <laughs> the second take, but they love, they, they prefer the first take. So actually, um, you can see me laughing underneath. <laughs> You weren't expecting it like that. <laughs> yeah. Then moving on to your music. Your last album was Music for Elevators, and that was back in 2002. Can you tell us a bit about that album? That was, uh, I was approached when I was in L.A. doing doing Buffy. And I, you know, basically, I've uh, music has always been there. Mm-hmm. I, I've done, done session vocals and things for people. I used to, I've done a lot of my brother's early albums we sang together. Um, and so music's always been there. I used to be in a band in the 80s. And then sort of it came to the point where I kind of, I had to make a decision either to just really to pursue the music and really go for it or to pursue the acting. Mm-hmm. Or sort of kind of fight, falling between two stools. I love them both so much. But choosing acting and to sort of sing when I, when I can, um, it worked out for me because, you know, actually acting is a much a much longer career mm-hmm. and it gives you opportunities to sing whereas if I'd gone for rock and roll purely rock and roll it's short lived life and it's so tenuous and um, you can get caught up in all sorts um, sort of management stuff and uh, record company stuff and it just you know we in the end we just decided to, to let it go but it meant that when this record company approached me in LA uh, and they said they had an artist called George Sarah who was an electronic composer and they said, would you like to do an album with me and I, and I was a bit 
bit nervous at first. So I yeah. thought, you know, oh, what I don't want to do is I don't want to be an actor who sings. Well, I am, but I don't <laughs> want to be one of those actors that releases an album and everybody goes, oh, my goodness, they do what they do. Yeah. Um, so I was a bit nervous about it, but then, um, again, Sarah, my partner, said, well, why don't you, why don't you involve people that you're working with and, and sort of make it very much about the time in L.A.? Uh, and I thought, actually, it was a really great idea, um, and I had a lot of songs to write at that time. And so I met up with George, and we sort of, we collaborated, uh, and, you know, he taught me a new way of, of songwriting, because I'm used to the sort of um, standard um, verse, um, which called verse, but, you know, the, the middle eight, and so basically the, 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 the classic way of writing a song, and, and electronic composing uh, is completely different. You sort of, you find a riff, let it run until it gets boring, and then you stick something else in. <laughs> <laughs> you repeat as, as you need. Um, and you sort of do lots of sampling, and uh, it, it was a really interesting experience. And in fact, it's a, it's a, the album was a hybrid, mm-hmm. uh, and a sort of my stuff, my style and his style. And, I, and I, for the most part, there's a couple of things that now I look back and I go, mm, I, I kind of wish I hadn't bowed to keeping that in, because if we kept it sort of short, um, there were a few little filler tracks which, which George really liked which yeah. sort of now, now go oh, I don't know about that but there's some really some songs that I'm very proud of some really nice stuff um, and it's yeah, that stood the test of time um, it doesn't feel too dated well I really loved your rendition of the Beatles We Can Work It Out with Holly Palmer was that your own arrangement on that song I loved it thank you thank you I, mean, I must admit it was at that I, I stole the idea for that. Uh, a friend of mine, Jo Munro, um, who did it, um, she had a band at one point, she did it with um, with a bass player. Uh, and she she had the idea of slowing it down to make it a, 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 a sort of haunting love song uh, and doing it as a duet. And so um, I'd long wanted to record it and um, it ended up like that. In fact, that was one of, the, one of those tracks. There's always a track which is difficult, just doesn't seem to want to be recorded. And I remember when, when, when George laid down the, um, the, the the basic rhythm track, and I was, it was fighting. And then sort of, I had to talk him through where I thought it should go, and you know, we went backwards and forwards. And eventually, I'm, you know, I'm really very, very pleased with the, um, with the, with the and Holly was, was in uh, acting class uh, with me at the time. And uh, I thought, I went to see her play live, and she's got the most amazing voice mm-hmm. um, I loved all I mean and I said would sing and she was up for it um, and I had I had lots of people I had um, one of the first track of my teacher Milton Salve no longer he's, he's, he's on it uh, there's all sorts of people Alice is on it James is on it there's a couple of people from class on it it's just you know and, it, and it's it makes it quite a, a personal um, sort of little statement really of my time in LA well, no, your new album is out now, Staring at the Sun. That's quite different. How would you describe the musical style of this album? Um, again, it's eclectic, but for a different reason. Um, I originally thought I would do an album of sort of classics, mm-hmm. um, like 40s, 50s classics. Uh, and my mum gave me a list of songs, really lovely songs, and I was preparing for that, and... Suddenly, a bunch of people released. <laughs> <laughs> they stole your idea. <laughs> along the same, it was like, oh, I'm not going to do that then. <laughs> so I looked around at what I had and what I could write, and um, basically, the people have been asking me ever since um, Music for Elevators to do an acoustic album. And so I thought, I didn't want to just do me playing a guitar, which is, I have a feeling is what they, they meant, because occasionally at fan conventions and things, I get up on stage and play the guitar yeah. um, and sing um, but because I play in an open tuning um, all the chords are the same just in a different order and, and so like that mm-hmm. would get very boring <laughs> so um, I, I approached a friend of mine Seb Pekia who has a, a studio in Bath to be um, he used to work at real he was Peter Gable's engineer and uh, he has his own place in Bath and said would you like to do an album and 
yes. And I said, so this is the brief. I want to do an album using acoustic instruments. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right, okay. But actually, when you broke it down, um, I, there were, I did a lot of uh, demos. This is the difference between everything else I've ever done. I did some, uh, I demoed every, pretty much everything on it. Uh, and this is the first time that I've actually used demos as this is the way I want the track. Yeah. Um, because demos are usually, this is the kind of feel, and then let's go from there. But I, we like the demos so much that we pretty much, okay, let's redo the demos, but, but record them properly. Um, and that worked pretty much across the board. Um, and I have to admit, I did written a little sort of note beginning of, uh, uh, the, of the album that, that pretty much we stuck to the, um, the acoustic um, brief. Uh, there is a little bit of Hammond organ every now and again. Um, and not much, pretty much all, all acoustic bass, upright bass, a couple of places we might have augmented it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Then there's, there's cello and, and, and arco double bass and uh, piano, a lot of piano um, and some you know, acoustic guitars. And some of the guitars are a little treated, but they are actually acoustic guitars. Um, but pretty much we, we, the, the, the demo thing actually works. There's only one song which um, sort of got out of out of control, not out of control, but that thing when musicians play and throw in a different curve. Yeah. Absolutely, you know, you're listening to it going, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then when you listen back to the track, you're going, oh, well, it's actually drifted away from what it was. Yeah. And now it sounds a bit light and a bit, mm, that's not right. Mm, you know. um, so we then, we wrestled with it a bit and we, we edited the, the drums and we did Stuff. And it, now it actually it's, it's real groove and it's back to the groove that it was in in, in, in its infancy as it were in, in demo form. But I'm really pleased with the way it's turned out. Um, it's a, as I say, it's very eclectic. It's an interesting mix. There's six original songs and four covers. Um, two of the covers are uh, classic songs. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, uh, I did uh, the way you look tonight. Um, Beautiful song. I recorded for Sarah because she loved the song. Oh. But it's, we looked for it on, online, and it was, everybody swings it. Everybody swings it. And there's, you can't find a straight version of it. And so um, I, I recorded it for, for, for one Valentine. Oh, that's lovely. Just me and piano and this um, really lovely uh, local pianist called Anders Olin. Um, plays on, on a few of the tracks on the album. And... Um, so I decided to leave it in just because uh, it's 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 quite a sweet sweet song, and we've left it as it's the last last track on the album. We've left it as a sort of a, a smoky late night kind of. Yeah. And I did um, under my skin. Uh, under my skin has always always struck me as uh, a, quite a dark song. Um, it's basically about a you know the, the gay man in love with another man when he's married and struggling with with that that whole back in the 30s I mean that was you know, that was just no different times um, and it's, it's everyone always again always swings it um, and I came up with a, a, a string arrangement that uh, works I think works it's a very very different very different treatment of it than anybody else's I've never heard of anything anybody else doing like it um, and there's Behind Blue Eyes, which is something which I originally sang on Buffy, which uh, a lot of lot of fans have been wanting me to do ever since. Because there's only two verses of it on Buffy. Yeah. Because from after the two verses, it goes into Townsend's electric, and it, it, it kind of steps up a notch, and that's quite... <laughs> so they get to hear the full version now it from works. you. But um, I asked a, a dear friend in LA if he would have a bash. Uh, I, did, I, I arranged it for guitar and then he, he played to that um, and it's come out really nicely it's very very again it's very haunting well that's it I heard a sm- on your website which you're developing at the moment you would some clips from the album there if anybody wants to go on and have a, a quick listen and it sounds fantastic I have to say great vocals on it thank you it's, it's um, as I say it's, it's, I mean so far pretty much it. I mean everybody that's listened to it and people find different things that they like in it. Yeah. Um, people have different 
different favourite songs, which for me is, is that's, that's the best. If there's not just one standout song that everybody goes, oh, that's the one. Yeah. But everybody, you know, and there's sort of two or three that, that seem to be coming out favourites. But um, that's, you know, that's what I want. I want, I want it to sort of, I want it to generate a bit of chat. And we, Sarah and I, we, uh, we visited um, Ireland a few weeks back. I've seen that on your, your Facebook page. Go, you were in Athenry, was it? Uh, yes. We went out to uh, the Hungry Horse Outside, which was a, a, a great charity, and um, we played the album on, in the car. And it was the first time I hadn't listened to it for a while, and we had I had the, um, the mask, basically. It was the first time I was able to listen to it objectively without listening for new horses. Yeah, we well, were just sitting back, relaxing, and have it on. And we just, it was lovely. It was really kicked back, and it was just a really nice... Um, I want to say gentle, but gentle sort of sounds a bit... Mm. <laughs> <It's>, uh, it, <laughs> um, it has a really nice vibe to it. It's, um, it's got some little lifts and some little, you know, and some, um, some, some haunting moments. And it just, um, it, it flows. Yeah. And that's, and that I also, sorry, I'm banging on. Um, <laughs> You're not at all. I set out to actually record 10 songs. Because usually what you do for an album is you record more than you need and you pick what works best mm. and you leave some out. But uh, for me, that sometimes you end up losing some of the be- some of the best songs just because they haven't quite made you know past muster. And as I said, there was only one that drifted originally, you know, from our from from where we were going with it, um, and we pulled it back. And so I set out to record these 10 songs and I'm really pleased with the way they turned out um, because there was a flow, there was a sort of, you know, there's, they literally, when I was choosing the songs, it was about what would work with what, what you know, how, how they would balance. And we, mm-hmm. we pretty much set the order very early on and um, it really works. There's, there's a really nice flow to it. And is there a tour planned? <laughs> Are you coming to Ireland? <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, no. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, you know, to be honest, yes. I mean, I'd, uh, I'd, the, the idea of touring is fun. Yeah. But to be honest, it's, you know, I mean, I, I would, I'd be happy to do, I don't know, a few bars, you know, how about you, then do you put a band together, do you just do it as a sort of semi, a little acoustic gig, mm. and on guitar, do you do it, do I play, do, you know, it's one of those, do you, do you have drums? Do you, you know, it's all that sort of stuff. And also, it means you've got to take a chunk of time out. Well, that's it. To it. Um, and thankfully, touch wood, I'm, I'm quite busy. So, um, I mean, the album has actually taken a year to record and get out, largely because it's been sort of been my acting has sort of disrupted it every time again, just because I've had to, I've had to go off and, and do things. And so the thought of doing it to and... and the acting, Nick getting in the way of the acting, or the acting getting in the way of it. But um, you know, again, never say never. Um, if if uh, I don't know, if a couple of things come up, I'd certainly have a think about it. And then, where can people purchase Staring at the Sun? Well, it will be up and running um, by the time you get this out. It will be up and running. So it's Anthony Head dot Banzoogle B A N D Z O O G L E dot com. Perfect. Bandzoogle.com. Perfect. And I'll put the link up on the, the Facebook page for the show as well. Yep. And it'll be, it'll be you can order um, uh, copies and also downloads from that. And at some point, uh, it may be on iTunes or but, you know, we'll have a look at that. But at the minute, we just, we, we just, we've got it all in one place. Fantastic. Well, Anthony, it has been such an honour to have you on the show and I'm wishing you the very best of luck with the album. Thank you.